What is going on, everybody? It's the France, and we're here for a Monday Night Raw review for September the 14th, 2020. Raw in your face, whatever the fuck that means. Unfortunately, tonight we had to listen to Michael Cole again for three hours, but usually we have some OJ over there, and it would be a nice palate cleanser from having to deal with Michael Cole. But we didn't even get that tonight because Michael Cole was joined by Byron Saxton and Dolph Ziggler. So, we had to listen to Dolph Ziggler for the majority of the show. He wasn't there the entire night, but we had to listen to Dolph Ziggler. I don't know what they were talking about saying that Tom Phillips and Smojo had the night off. I don't know why they're not at these shows. I think, and of course I think anyone else can um, assume, is that they caught Corona. And WWE is taking the precautions to keep them off TV so no one else can get it. But we go right now, comes Drew McIntyre in street clothes. He poses, he raises his title. We go to a video package of a few with Randy Orton with footage from last week, of the last few weeks. Drew addresses Orton and says he should be happy. His head is still attached for after those three Claymore kicks. Regarding his own status, Drew says WWE Medical told him to take some time off. But if he did that, he'd have to give up the WWE title. And he told them no. One bad hit, and he will have to probably... One, like, he was also told by his doctors, one bad hit to his jaw. And it had to be wide shut. But he'd rather leave the raw in an ambulance each week rather than give up his title and tell his woman that to get his nurses at the hospital to turn up the volume uh, so he can hear this, he says, it is only appropriate that the next time they meet at Clash of Champions, someone leaves in an ambulance. He says, their match at Clash of Champions should be... An ambulance match. He's talking about the recent Claymore kick victims. He also gave us a history lesson of how the Claymore kick was... How he came up with the Claymore kick. Even mentioning how he was wearing these tight pants. And when he went for a big boot, he made a laugh about... We we got... Um, I, we Scottish are allergic to wearing underwear. So instead of doing a big boot, I lifted my other leg up. Hit... My opponent knocked him crazy, knocked myself dizzy, and if I would if I refine this move, it would be the most devastating move ever. So they show a Photoshop version of all of his victims and like heads of everybody, including Dolph Ziggler, Randy Orton, so on and so forth. When out comes Adam Pierce. He talks about the seriousness of, seriousness of Orton's status and says Orton may be unable to face Drew in any kind of match. Now, Drew's match with Keith Lee becomes one more than a match because between friends with bragging rights. If Lee beats him tonight and Orton is unable to face McIntyre, then Lee will be the number one contender to Drew McIntyre at Clash of Champions. Pierce turns to walk away and Drew wonders who put him in charge. Out comes Keith Lee. Well, you know what? Adam Pearce has been seen on both Raw and SmackDown over the last, what is it, four or five months. Pretty much acting like a commissioner or a general manager. Let's make it official. Commissioner Adam Pearce. Can we just put commissioner on his name? Seriously. The dude has been making matches. The dude has been the liaison between the talent and Vince McMahon on TV. Just make it. It's official. I mean, who else are you going to have making matches or anything else? Just say, Adam Pearce is the commissioner of both Raw and SmackDown. And get it over with. Now, Lee comes in the ring. They shake hands. Drew says some words to him. He goes to Lee, but Lee won't let go. They keep, they keep the shake locked, and we go to commercial break. We come back, and it's time for the quarterly brand-to-brand -brand invitational, as it's the Cesaro and Nakamura versus the Street Profits. And Cesaro is obviously one of the best tag team specialists in WWE. Him and He just works with anybody, honestly. Him, I would put him up there with somebody like a Bobby Roode, even though I think he's better than Bobby Roode, but him and Bobby Roode are two of the guys who you could put with anybody and they're going to have a great tag team. This was a nice match. It was a great, it was a good match. Back and forth between these two teams. 
Cash out. Cesaro doesn't see Dawkins go to the top and hit the cash out. Splash for the legal man. As the legal man, Dawkins holds him for the pin and the win. The Street Profits are your winners. After the, mat, Ford and Do- After the match, Ford and Dawkins stand tall and raise their titles in the air. The Profits continue celebrating as Ziggler tells Cesaro and Nakamura that they got outclassed. On Raw tonight. They are the veterans. They should have seen it coming. But they just got outclassed. Now, Clash of Champions is coming up. Not this Sunday, but the Sunday after. Both of these titles have to be on the line. Every title has to be on the line. Here's an idea. Instead of having tag team, like this tag team versus the Arm Street Profits and this tag team versus the Cesaro Nakamura, why not put these two titles on the line, champion versus champion, winner takes all, unify these titles, merge these two divisions, and we can have... A tag team, a tag team um, division that is at least worth something. Because honestly, who do you got on Monday Night Raw? You have the Viking Raiders, the Street Profits, and probably the Hurt Business because Cesaro, I'm sorry, not Cesaro, but Andrade and Angel Garza are on their way to Splitsville. AOP got released. There is nobody else. Merge the divisions. When the Usos come back, to, come back, and the New Day come back, you have the Street Profits, the New Day, the Usos, Miz and Morrison, Lucha House Party, the Viking Raiders, the Hurt Business, Cesaro and Nakamura, Heavy Machinery. That's nine teams that I can think of off the top of my head. That would be better than having two divisions where you have possibly three on Raw and six on SmackDown. Just when everyone's back to being in, um, from injury. Cole leads a video of Mickey, package of Vicky James ahead of her, Mickey James ahead of her na- title shot against Oscar. The announcers hype the match. Lana is backstage with Angel Garza. She can't believe Mickey James already has a title shot when it should be Natalia. She goes on praising Natalia. Garza agrees that this is unfair and says Lana's passion just, for justice is intoxicating. The dude who is either engaged or married to his girl, his woman, is being play is being portrayed as a pretty much as a man whore. Just gonna say it right there. Zelina walks up to with Andrade and asks Lana to give them a minute. Vega rants on Garza and tells him he's tr- tired of he, he, about how he walked out on um on Andrade last week, and he needs to put he needs to stop. Being selfish, and he's like, you know what? I'm tired of this. I'm tired of being blamed for all of our our problems because I didn't lose the last match last week. Andrade lost the match last week. The tension continues. Andrade steps up to Garza. They argue, and Vega goes in between them. She says, "I am done with this. I can't do this anymore." They. She walks off. Garza and Andrade brawl a bit, and we go to commercial break. So, like I said, that team is on to Splitsville very, very soon. Back from break, we see the Mysterio family backstage. Dominic, Ray, and his wife Angie, and daughter Aaliyah. And boy, they... I don't know. It just feels like... I know Aaliyah's like 19 years old now. It feels like they're going to try and start integrating her into this a little bit more. I wish they wouldn't. Because all you're going to see on Twitter and all you're going to see on social media is the creeps come out. You bring a very beautiful 19-year-old out to people for people to see. And the creeps are going to come out at night. Just saying. Cedric Alexander versus Ricochet, we go to the ring, and out comes the Hurt Business, which I forgot what their music sounded like for a minute. I was like, what the hell is this music? And then all four of them come out, I was like, oh yeah, that's right, that's the Hurt Business. Cedric at the MVP shot in Benjamin and United States Champion Bobby Lashley. We see how Cedric joined the Hurt Business last week. Apollo, um, I'm sorry, not Apollo, but Byron Saxon on commentary is just all beside himself. I can't believe this happened. Really, they've been pushing it for like weeks before it t- happened. It was going to happen eventually. And hopefully that things, if unless Vince McMahon changes his mind in a week or two, Cedric Alexander could come out of this a bigger star or a somewhat bigger name than he was going into it. <sighs> MVB takes the mic and makes it official. Now some business is booming. He goes on about why life is good in each of them. Cedric takes talks about his social media blowing up last week. Oh, Cedric, how could you turn on Ricochet and said uh, and I'm um, Apollo Cruz like that? And he's like, "Listen, this is my job. You have no idea what it's like to be me, having to come to Monday Night Raw and do nothing while Cedric while Apollo Cruz gets a title shot. Ricochet, one of the most talked about talents in WWE. 
This is his job. He does whatever it takes to succeed. He goes about getting beat up every week by the Hurt Business and being too beat up for Tuesday to play with his kids. But he's interrupted by the music and out comes Ricochet and Apollo Crews. And I just loved his way of saying, listen, this is my job. Just that, just that fire in him. Like, he's just... Like, dude, enough of the games, no, enough of the smiling, enough of everything. This is my job, and I'm going to come here to make sure I can provide for my kids. He's doing a hell of a better job than Ariel Monroe is, a.k.a. Big Swole, just saying. Crew yells at Cedric for the turning of them and telling that, selling them out. He says Cedric is too weak-minded, and now he has to live with the consequences from the decision he made. The argument continues. Ricochet says last week turn hurts more... Than any beating. He says now he and Cruz are coming for Cedric. He drops the mic and where we go. The bell rings and Ricochet immediately takes Cedric down. As it is Cedric Alexander versus Ricochet as we said. They go in to trade offenses. Let's see here. Ricochet goes to the top for a 450 but it's still, but he has to roll through. He comes right back but Cedric catches him with the Michinoku driver for a close two count. Cedric blocks a shot and nails a big lumbar check in the middle of the ring. Out of nowhere for the one, two, three. And Cedric Alexander wins. And I'm like, whoa, wow. Now, usually in WWE's done this, is that you have a big turn or somebody joining a group like um, Cedric Alexander joining the Hurt Business. And in the very next match that they have, you know what happens? That person loses. Thankfully, that didn't happen here. And hopefully, there's going to be stock put into the Hurt Business. But can this be the last time... These guys go against Cedric Alexander and Apollo Crews. Move them on. Give me the Hurt Business going for the Street Profits. You have Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin. MVP needs to be the manager for these guys. Get these two into a title contention. It's not going to be a clash. That's too early in my opinion. But get these two at the Clash of Champions, whoever it's going to be, whoever they face. As soon as the match is over... Cedric Alexander, I mean, not Cedric Alexander, but the Hurt Business comes and beats down the Raw Tag Team Champions, leading to Hell in a Cell, where Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin can win the Raw Tag Team titles, adding to the gold of the Hurt Business. But that's just me. After the match, the Hurt Business stands tall in the, set, in the ring as Cedric celebrates, minus Lashley. The, fan, the fans go blank in the LED rows. The lights go, go out. The Retribution logo appears on some of the screens. We see several members of the group standing in the back somewhere. One member of the group speaks and says they are the product of empty promises, lies, and betrayal. The ones trusted, but now they walk with eyes wide open. He goes on, and then the big man, apparently um, Dijakovic, speaks, adding that they see the what superstars are made of waste, scrap, byproduct. They see how the superstars show loyalty to an entity that... that Cast people aside like garbage when you think when you do that, you become garbage. When you sell your soul to a corrupt machine, you become a you become corrupt. He goes on and says that once thought their time at the WWE Performance Center would lead to fame and wealth, but now they refuse to suck up to the machine. While you enjoy your last days of oblivion, a retribution is prepared to show you exactly who they are to go on and declare that they are a retribution. The screen goes blank, the lights return, and the fans in the LED now also return. MVP Benjamin and Alexander stand together in the ring, ready for a fight, but the crowd is just booing them. So, okay, so basically, what I'm getting from this is that Retribution are supposed to be a bunch of talent who were in NXT, who never got to the highs of the highs that they're hoping for, like, you know... A, like, like a Johnny Gargano, a Tommaso Ciampa, an Adam Cole, and the Undisputed Era, Keith Lee, and other ones like that. They were just... Which, Dajakovic really wouldn't make any sense because, other than the fact that he never really won a championship in, the, in NXT, he was a very prominent figure with his feud with Keith Lee. But other than that, I guess, yeah, he didn't really do nothing. Mia Yim, if she's in this, which apparently she people have um, noticed that like just from the eyes... Or something, and the skin color, or whatever, they could tell that this person was me again, or that person was Dajakovic. And it's like, you gotta. The message, the message. Yeah, last week's message would have made sense if the whole entire retribution was a bunch of talent who got fired back on April 15th, being rehired as a force coming in to get retribution for their firings. But unfortunately, that's not the case. 
This one, I, uh, I, I just don't. It's all going to depend on who the final members are. Who's the actual members of Retribution? Dajakovic will be interesting. But I couldn't. I just can't see Dajakovic being the leader of Retribution. I just don't. He seems like he would be the muscle to... Honestly, if they wanted to make a one of the female people, members a leader, depending on who it is, I could see that. But I just, I just don't see... Dajakovic being the brains of the operation. But we'll have to wait and see what happens. This one, I just I just don't seem to... I want to care or try to care, but it's just like... It's been booked so piss poorly. And honestly, I think WWE is doing this... Is trying to rebook this a little bit differently. Because honestly, for the first few weeks of this entire thing... It's been lackluster at best. And now they're ha now you're having promos... For this group, but you should have been having from the very start. Instead of having that video, that surveillance video of them throwing Molotov cocktails and mimicking Antifa, this is what this, this is what you went with, and now you're going to go the way you should have been from the beginning. Lights getting turned off, a message like the the the, the signia being shown, them on the Titan Tron. Saying out their messages, beating down people here and there, maybe, but it's like it's a little too late. I honestly think, think for retribution. Can they recover it? Maybe, but this is WWE. So she was backstage with Mickey James. She asks her emotion fills her as she prepares for the night's title match. Mixie goes on about how she loves the business and what she has got given to them to it. What a high stakes like high stakes champion like Oscar brings out in her. Goes on about her wisdom and her clarity, noting it's become clear to her that she's always had what it takes to become Raw Women's Champion. But what fuels her tonight is knowing that this, that, that this could become her last chance to win the Raw Women's title as she walks off. Now, the last time these two faced off for a championship it was the NXT Women's Championship. I believe, I don't remember she having a Raw Women's title match against Asuka. But for the NXT Women's Championship at TakeOver Toronto... Back in what was it, 2016? Or 20, I think it was 2016, right? Yeah, 2016, 2017. I think it was 2016 or 2017, whatever the year it was. That was a heck of a match. Tonight was one hell of a match, except for that finish. Mickey drops Oscar in the kick in the, with a kick to the jaw, but barely connects. Oscar kicks out of two, grabbing the bottom rope for just in time, which of course Mickey is just. Like, what does it have to take to knock, take this woman down? Maybe hitting your, hitting the jaw all the way? Oscar catches Mickey and rolls her into an armbar on the mat. More back and forth from the roll on, on the mat now. Oscar blocks the Mick DDT, which is what they want to call it. Mickey fights Oscar off and rolls her into a two count. Oscar takes James right back down into the Oscar lock. Mickey resists, but the referee calls the match out of nowhere, apparently saying Mickey tacked out. You just see this look on Mickey's face like, what the fuck? She didn't tap, apparently, or, like, I don't know what the what else this finish was. It felt like they were, they, like, the, and of course they're live. It's not like they were taped. If, it was, if they were taped, they could have this match go a full hour and cut it down to 30 minutes or 15 minutes if they wanted to. I don't know what happened to that finish. Who, like, if it was supposed to go that way, maybe Mickey was supposed to tap. I don't know, but all I know is, is that... <laughs> WWE don't know, like, even WWE referees fuck up. It'll probably be on Botchamania in the next week or so. After the match, it was not that Oscar wins as Mickey can no longer continue. The referee hands the title to Oscar. Music interrupts and out comes, of all people, Zelina Vega. We see the referee checking on Mickey at ringside as Vega takes the mic and starts ranting about how she's been taking, thinking of her future. Today, it dawned on her that she has wasted some of the best years of her career managing two selfish ingrates like Andrade and, Zelina and, and Angel Garza. Ingrates, just like Asuka. She says, Asuka was handed the title by one of the greatest, but she has been nothing but reckless with it. Um, you do realize that that title reign ended in a bullshit finish, and then she won. Um, she beat Sasha Banks. Fair and square at payback. Oh, I'm sorry, at SummerSlam. 
So you do whoever wrote this promo must have forgot that Oscar lost the championship about four or five it's like five or six weeks ago and then won it back at SummerSlam. Really? Because Oscar has been so worried about the superstars of yesterday ignoring one of the greatest of today. Vega says she's here to tell Oscar she's ready for that title. Oscar fires back with some Japanese and laughing in her face. Vega rocks her with a slap. Oscar looks to come back, but Vega exits the ring, taunting Oscar. Oscar's music starts up as the two superstars continue taunting each other. I'm sorry. Vega does not have does not deserve a title match. The last time Zelina Vega was in a singles match, if I'm correct, she was losing to Bianca Belair. Why do we need why does she why does she think she deserves a championship match? She hasn't even done anything. Yes, you have been using your time to manage Andrade and Angel Garza. So if you want to go for a title, that's fine, but you need to start winning. You need to start having like consistent matches. You do not deserve to be in the title picture whatsoever. Zelina Vega versus Oscar does not interest me one bit. Zelina Vega hasn't done anything in the women's division in weeks, if not months. Other than her feud with um, Bianca Belair over poisoning Te- um, Montez Ford, she hasn't done anything. So her from all of a sudden come out on Monday Night Raw tonight and be like, you know what? I deserve a title match. What? On whose authority? Are you kidding me? That cannot be the match at, at, at um, Clash of Champions. Just no way that can be the match. <sighs> Charlie Cruz is backstage with Keith Lee. He goes about his opportunity to face WWE Champion Drew McIntyre. They know each other for a long time and have been honest about possibly having to face each other. Just like he's been honest about Drew not interfering in his matches, Lee goes on and says he knows Drew will do whatever it takes to remain WWE Champion. And Lee will do what it must to become WWE Champion. Who is to ask about Joe's jaw? And Lee doesn't want to take advantage, advantage of any injury to his friend has. But to come here and be WWE Champion, like he said, he will do what he must. He walks off and we go to commercial break. And then we come back to Bobby Lashley versus Eric of the Viking Raiders. Because Ivar is out with injury. So Eric is a single star for now. Oh boy. This, honestly, to me, is going to be WWE going a dry run to see if they can break up the Viking Raiders. It's going to come. It's going to fucking come. Because Vince McMahon loves, unless you're the Usos or the New Day, Vince McMahon loves breaking up tag teams. If the Viking Raiders are told that we're breaking you guys up, I'm like, well, we're leaving. We're not going to do that. They are, the War Raiders, the War Machine have been war, have been tag team for years. I know they haven't started. They didn't start out as a tag team, but why would you break them up? If you break up the war, uh, the war, the Viking Raiders, then that means Raw has the Street Profits and the Hurt Business, and that is it. Great, just just great. Lashley wins in about two and a half minutes. Full Nelson. After the bell, he stands tall, raises the title, and the music hits. We go to replays. Kevin Owens is backstage with Sarah Shriver. Ask him what he, why he thinks Alistair Black developed a personal vendetta against him. Owens goes on about how there could be several reasons why. He talks about he takes shots at Black and says he doesn't care about why, just how. How is he going to inflict enough pain on Black tonight to feel like they are even? To make sure Black doesn't just walk, he runs back to his hiding spot, and now... And how he's going to give a beating that constantly reminds Black what happened every when what happens whenever you pick a fight with Kevin Owens. Owens isn't really worried about any of those things. Do you know why? Because he's Kevin Owens. He turns and walks away. Black appears and stares him down with the eye covering still on, which makes no sense because he tore the eye covering off last week when it came to the fight in um, Raw Underground. So why are you wearing the eye covering again? It was just fine last week, but this week you got to put it back on. Shane McMahon is backstage with the extra-large underground security. Shane says last week will be nothing compared to this week. And then Braun Strowman approaches. And my God, when you see the security guy, I don't remember his damn name, but when you see him towering over Braun Strowman, 
Holy shit, that guy. You, you don't realize how tall this guy is until Braun Strowman, who is no st- um, short guy, is smaller than the security guard. Wow. Strowman tells them both to get out of his way. He's pissed off. He knows that on, on the other side of the door is some poor soul he can smash their heads in. Strowman again threatens Shane and he is security and tells them to send his best fighter so he can send them home to his mother with a pocket full of teeth. Strowman enters Raw Underground and the door is closed behind him. Back to the, to the steel cage to the announcers. MVP has joined Cole and Saxon on commentary, which tells you Dolph Ziggler is probably back in Raw Underground about to get himself killed. We see a video package of the recent feud between Dominic and Seth Rollins and Murphy. Seth is backstage now when Murphy knocks on the door. Rollins tells him to come in. Murphy brings up what the Mysterio family did to him last week and Rollins gets in. He says forgiveness is part of the process, but it's all in the past. Now they have to look forward to tonight in the future. He says tonight's steel cage match is the perfect opportunity for them to teach Dominic and the world a lesson. Rollins makes Murphy ask Murphy if he's prepared for his role tonight and has he has something very important for Murphy to do and that he needs him to be ready. He's asked Murphy if he's ready and Murphy is. He smacks Murphy back, tells him grab him, and then grabs him by the face and says Murphy's role tonight is to stay in the back so he doesn't have to deal with any of his stupid mistakes. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Rollins smacks him again and says Murphy is fuming. Rollins grabs him by the face and he bullies him some more before walking off. He stares Murphy stares Rollins down. We go to look at the cage in the arena and back to commercial break. Back from break, more 24-7 stuff. Okay. I don't even want to know. I don't even care. They announce to talk about how Manny Rose has been traded to Raw. And they get a brief coming soon promo. So, yay. Which, by the way, that happened on Talking Smack. On the WWE Network, which almost nobody watches. I've seen them. I've seen the, first, the one of the first few talking smacks and stuff, and they're trying to rebring back what made talking smack great back when it was Daniel Bryan and Renee Young. It just doesn't have that same feeling. This feels forced. It doesn't feel as natural as it then did then. Steel Cage match: Dominic Mysterio versus Seth Rollins. Can I just say Dominic Mysterio is becoming one of the best talents? On the roster. This is like his sixth match. But again. This was a good match. It's time to move on. From Seth Rollins. And the Mysterio family. Give me Mysterio. Dominic. Versus literally anybody else. I don't care if he has a couple matches. Against some t- um some performance center talent. I know why they're having him. I know why you're having Dominic. Versus Seth Rollins. versus And, and Murphy right now. Because those two are two some two of the best in WWE. And they can make Dominic look as good as he can. Remember, this is like Dominic's sixth match in WWE. And probably his sixth match overall in his wrestling career. So having a guy like Seth Rollins carry Dominic to a damn good match. Having Murphy do the exact same thing is going to be beneficial for Dominic. Somebody, somebody who could really benefit from... Um, from house shows right now would be Dominic more than anybody because having a match once a week, maybe like four times a month, maybe five with a pay per view. Well, he had six last month, but you know what I mean. But it's like, yeah, he could benefit from having a couple of those afternoon or like those night shows on the like say Friday and Saturday shows before or Friday, Saturday and Sunday um, shows. To get some matches under his belt. Hopefully we can have some kind of house shows. Which if WWE ever gets to a time when they can do some fans in the arena. It wouldn't surprise me if like Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday and Sunday become. like Say that at the Amway Center and say after October they can have like a hundred, like a thousand fans there. It wouldn't surprise me if WWE did some um, house show like things at the pro- at, at at the Amway Center to like you know sell some tickets and get these guys men and women experience because a guy like Dominic definitely needs just he just needs the matches under his belt. Like I said, six matches in a small in a short amount of time against Murphy and Seth Rollins over and over and over again. 
The feud needs to end, though. There were other great talents on this roster that they could have Dominic go up against. Dominic versus Kevin Owens would be fantastic. Dominic versus Dolph Ziggler. Dolph Ziggler could make Dominic look like the next five-star um, talent in WWE. Give us something else. Because it's just like the Hurt Business versus Cedric Alexander and, Do- and, and Ricochet. Not Cedric, I'm sorry. It's Apollo Crews and Ricochet. It's done to death. This is WWE Bruce Pritchard, Vince McMahon specialty though. Same match over and over and over and over and over again until you get tired of it and then they move on to something else and somebody gets left behind. But this match was rough, man. I'm not saying like in a bad way. But I don't know if it's in Dominic's contract for WWE, but he signed a contract. And I swear it's take... He has to take at least a thousand kendo stick shots before the end of the year because this motherfucker has been taking kendo stick shots for weeks now. And my goodness. Now, Dominic climbs to the top of the cage again to escape. Rollins comes over and tries to stop him. Dominic kicks Rollins to the mat. Dominic gets his leg over the top of the cage, but Rollins grabs him. Hits a huge superplex to the top of the cage, then a falcon arrow in the middle of the ring. Dominic still kicks out for a two. Rollins taunts Ray and his family through the cage. Dominic rolls Rollins from behind for a two count. Rollins comes right back in and stomps to Dominic. Rollins follows up with a second stop in the middle of the ring. Dominic's family, the family cheers Dominic on, but Rollins covers him for the pin in the win. After the bell, he Rollins music st- stands tall with Dominic staring at the family and taunting. Murphy opens the cage as door as Rollins makes his exit with the kendo stick in his hand. He turns to look at Murphy. And then drops the stick and grabs Murphy by his cheeks. Rollins has a few words for Murphy and then kisses him on the forehead. Rollins sends up and ends up sending Murphy into the barrier. Then drops the slant by drops him by slamming the door into his face and yells at Murphy in the crowd, saying, "How does that feel, huh? It sucks because I I know it how it feels because you did it to me." And he walks away while Murphy is, um, writhing writhing in pain. He does go over to. Aaliyah and um, Angie stares at them. He tells Angie that she did a hell of a job with Dominic, but he hopes her daughter Aaliyah turns out better. Rollins walks off. The family enters to check on Dominic, but Aaliyah, this is interesting. Aaliyah, before she gets into the ring, actually stops and, and and briefly checks on Murphy at the bottom before she comes in. So, that's a wrinkle that I wonder if that's going to do any, like, because you have her, she's here, she's 19, they can probably want to do something with her too, I don't know, maybe she does, I don't know what the um, plans are, but it feels like maybe, just maybe, WWE has plans for Aaliyah as well. It is what it is, we'll have to see what happens there, but Dominic, he's just one of those things that hopefully this ends. This has got to be it. We can you can take a break from Cedric from from Seth Rollins and the Mysterio family. Let Seth Rollins go off to do something else, and then we can come back to that after Survivor Series. Get us to something else, please. Raw on the ground happens. Ziggler's in the ring with an enhancement talent going back and forth. And Matt Ziggler beats the man down, and that's all I care about. That Riddick Mox steps up and next. Braun Strowman comes in. They have a big huge brawl. He decimates them both. Strowman stands and yells out as Shane asks. Who wants Strowman next? Back to commercial break. We get, the pre- we get the Pediatric Cancer Awareness Month video, as we used to do. Charlie Caruso is with WWE Champion Drew McIntyre. Bringing up Keith Lee's earlier made it clear that he will do whatever he has to to get a chance at the WWE title. Drew hopes he would be do anything it takes. He goes on about Lee and Ryan D. Orton. When Lee appears, Lee asks Caruso to excuse them, and she does. Drew asks if he can help Lee. Lee says it would be helpful if Drew didn't drag his name and reputation. He thought they were supposed to be friends. Drew says they are. But Lee shouldn't be spinning his words. Lee goes on and says Drew seems a little concerned that Lee may beat him tonight and then again at Clash. Drew mocks Lee and says he doesn't get concerned about nothing and he's certainly not afraid. The tension picks up. And then they, Drew rocks Lee in the mouth with the current right hand. They start brawling, and Drew sends Lee into the bathroom door. Lee counters an Irish whip and sends Drew into the port, the port production cart. Officials show up and get between them, and the brawl is broken up as the two competitors yell at each other. 
more underground stuff, don't really care. Kevin Owens will take on Aleister Black in the ring, which, remind you, they had a fight in Raw Underground last week that was interrupted by Dabo Kato. Why have the match in Underground if you're just going to have a match the very next week on regular Monday Night Raw? And, again, does anyone really care about Raw Underground? Because I sure as hell don't care about Raw Underground. And there's apparently supposed to be a championship being made for Raw Underground. Because Monday Night Raw doesn't have enough championships as it is. Kevin Owens versus Alistair Black, which, by the way, Alistair Black is now wearing bland, the bland, straight black tights. Long, like, long black tights. He's not wearing the small little skeevies anymore. Brawl between these two, Black returns to the ring and works on Owens' leg while he's down. Owens fights for the mat and Mark rocks Black in the eye. Black with a kick to drops Owens. He continues focusing on the hurt leg on the corner. Owens goes back down in the corner. Owens gets up and rocks Black in the face, which, again, I still don't know why he was wearing the face covering before the match tonight. I just don't. Like, you tore it off last week, your eye was completely fine, and tonight you came out with it was, uh. Black stops away on Owens, and the roulette referee backs him away. The fake boost um, pick up, but Owens gets up and delivers a big super kick out of nowhere. Both men are down. Owens hobbles up, but around... Uh, hobbles around, but his knee go- goes out. Black stands tall, but the lights flicker in the arena. Owens takes advantage of the distraction and drops him with a stunner for the pin in the win. Owens falls to the floor after the match, sells his hurt leg while they, while they, while down against the barrier. My problem with this is you just had Alistair Black turn heel, what? Three weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, and he's already losing. What was the point of the heel turn then, may I ask? What was the fucking point of the heel turn? We cut backstage to see Drew McIntyre getting ready for the main event. Keith attacks him and the brawl picks back up. Adam Pearce gets in between them and threatens to catch the next main event in the clash match if they don't stop. And we go back to commercial break. Riot Squad versus Lana and Natalia. This match lasts about a minute and a half. And the Riot Squad win now. The women's tag team champions were on commentary. It was announced today that Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot, who earned their title shot two weeks ago, will be taking on Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax at Clash of Champions. There were some idiots in the community who wanted to argue that Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot were just getting their title shot because Shayna Baszler lost last week. If you're too fucking stupid to remember... About two weeks ago, or three weeks, it was th- like two weeks ago, Liv Morgan and Ruby Riot faced off against the Iconics, or the Moronics, in a match that the winners became the number one contenders, and the losers had to split up. But some fucking idiots with a bigger podcast than I'll probably ever have think that, oh, it was just the losers lo- like have to break up. If you actually do your fucking job, dumbasses, you will realize that, oh... It was a number one contenders match with the loser having to break up. But yes, that is going to be happening at Clash of Champions. After the match, they stand tall in the ring. Shayna Baszler and Nia Jax hit the ring as their number one contenders back up the ramp. The two teams trade verbal shots. Jax and Baszler turn their attention to Lana and Natalya. Baszler tosses Lana to the floor, where Jax has cleared the top of the announce table. And the Riot Squad watches on stage as Jax puts Lana through the announce table with a big Samoan drop. whoop the fucking do Again, Lana should never be in the ring again. She should just be manager, and that is it. (sighs) Alistair Black, Zillian Vega, Shannon Basil, and Nigel Jackson announced for Raw Talk. Who gives a shit? More about underground stuff. I don't care. Drew McIntyre versus Keith Lee. This match doesn't, it, it goes for a while, but there is no, no finish. Lee and Drew attack the, I'm sorry, let me see, let me see. Drew kicks Lee first. Drew with a big chop. Now Lee draws the Claymore. Drew slides out of the spirit bomb. They collide in the middle, mid-air. Crossbody attempt and both go down. Then Retribution come out. A pre out ring sign coming through the crowd. They, sur- they surround the ring. And they go on the apron. Drew and Lee attack them. both, But they end up beat down by the masked male and female members of the group. Retribution is heavily booed by the fake crowd. As they stomp away on Lee and McIntyre. The song continues while Lee... And McIntyre are down. There are many members of Attribution. The, week, the music suddenly hits and out come the Hurt Business all in suits. 
Retribution will wait for them at ringside and ready to fight. The Hurt Business gets ready on stage. Retribution and the Hurt Business start brawling at ringside. Lee and McIntyre recover in the ring, then run the ropes together to leap out. Taking members from both groups down on the ringside, McIntyre and Lee get back down, back to their feet. While their bodies are down everywhere, the In Your Face edition of Raw goes off the air with McIntyre and Lee staring each other down while Retribution and the Hurt Business are laid out. So, what does that mean for what does that mean for Clash of Champions? It was a no fucking contest. What does that fucking mean? I don't understand how they could even book this. Who booked this shit? You had Adam Pearce at the beginning of the show say, if Randy Orton cannot con- cannot compete this at, at Clash of Champions and Keith Lee beats you, then it's going to be Keith Lee versus Drew McIntyre. And next week is the go-home show. So what happens with the title shot? We don't know. Who booked this shit? Because I sure as hell wouldn't have booked this shit. Have the match have a conclusive finish, then do the retribution spot. But we didn't get a conclusive finish, so... Is it Keith Lee versus Drew McIntyre? Which, by the way, is way too early in Keith Lee's run on the main roster. The guy should not be getting a title shot for at least... Like, Keith Lee should not be in the world title picture until we get to some to this Royal Rumble. And he could possibly win the Royal Rumble. Get this guy some wins against lower ear talent, lower card talent, building him up, and then beating guys like Randy Orton and Drew McIntyre. But again, what's going to happen with this title shot? I don't even fucking know, and I don't think anyone knows yet. Monday Night Raw, In Your Face, made no fucking sense. I know why they did the In Your Face name, because guess what? Tonight was the NFL uh, return to Monday Night Football. And WWE's numbers have been in the trash, in the toilet. Will they be there again? I don't know, most likely. But that is your Monday Night Raw in your face review. It really wasn't in your face. It sucked. Hit that subscribe button, comment down below. Like or dislike this video. Find me on Twitter at The France Club. Find me on twitch.tv slash The France Club. Find me on Instagram at The France Club. And I'll see you guys Wednesday for... And it is Wednesday... AEW on TNT as we get closer to the anniversary show in October. Until then, my name is The Front, and I'll see you guys later.